Hi everybody, this is Agnes from No Sediment and today we're going to talk about how the greatest sparkling wine in the world, Champagne, is made. When we talk about Méthode Champenoise, also known as Méthode Classique, one of the most important things to remember is that Champagne is made in the very same bottle that I'm holding here in my hands or you have back at home and are about to pop open. There are a few exceptions though, which I discuss in more detail in one of the videos I made about Champagne bottle sizes. Let's go back to the beginning. The grapes themselves. There are three principal grape varieties in Champagne, Pinot Noir, Meunier and Chardonnay. Because two of these three grapes are dark-skinned, yet majority of Champagne is white, it is very important to press the grapes as quick and gentle as possible. In fact, the amount of juice pressed is strictly controlled. The first 20.5 hectoliters pressed from 4,000 kilograms of grapes are called cuvée. The next 5 hectoliters are called taille. That means that only 25.5 hectoliters are allowed to be extracted from 4,000 kilograms of grapes. While cuvée is largely regarded as the best and purest part, some will argue that little addition of taille will make champagne more aromatic and add some complexity and character to it. The fresh juice, also called as must, will undergo a simple alcoholic fermentation, reaching alcohol content of 10.5 to 11.5%. This is called Winclair, and while I have never had the chance to taste these still champagnes to be, some say that they are highly acidic and quite neutral on the palate. Champagne is essentially a blend. Most often than not, it is a blend of different vintages, different grape varieties, different regions and villages, and also it can be a blend of different winemaking techniques. The final yet very still blend is then placed in this very same bottle that I hold here in my hands. Then liqueur de tirage is added, which essentially is a mix of sugar and yeast. This bottle is then closed with a crown cup, which is similar to that of beer. And off it goes into the cellars. This is where the wine gains its signature effervescence, its soul, the bubbly character. The second fermentation happens in the bottle. The yeast starts to transform the added sugar into alcohol. And because the bottles are sealed, the side product, which is carbon dioxide, will have nowhere to escape, allowing it to slowly incorporate into the wine and creating bubbles. It is a popular belief that the lower the temperature, the slower the process, thus leading to more delicate and tinier bubbles. The second fermentation usually takes six to eight weeks, yet champagne is not done yet. This is not my quote, and I don't remember who said it, but I absolutely love it. It went something like this. When yeast has consumed all the sugar available to it, it, as every self-respecting living organism, dies and starts to decompose itself. Great, isn't it? This is called yeast autolysis. And champagne can live almost for eternity on these yeast sediments called lees. I am exaggerating, of course, but you get my point. This is also the time when champagne gets all of its bready and creamy characters. This process is so important that it actually is controlled and the minimum aging requirement is set, which is 12 months for non-vintage and three years for vintage champagne. I said that every single bottle of champagne has undergone the second fermentation in the very same bottle that you and I have at home. That means that yeasty sediment was also in that same bottle, yet we do not have any yeast. And most of the champagne that we enjoy is clear and bright. That means that yeast has been removed. During all this aging on the lees process, champagne bottles are kept horizontally. When a winemaker decides that yeast must be removed, the bottles are placed in pupitres. Pupitres. I'm sorry, my French is terrible. 
This is where sediment that might be stuck to the side of the bottle is loosened up in the process called remouage. Historically, this was done by hands, by shaking and lifting up the bottles with neck pointing down. This process used to take four to six weeks. Nowadays, it is usually done with the help of machines and takes only one week. Essentially, all the yeasty sediment is collected at the crown cup when bottles are pointing down. This is when the neck of the bottle is frozen, also freezing the sediment and a little bit of the wine itself. And when the crown cup is removed, the pressure that is in the bottle will push that frozen part out, leaving our champagne clean. After the disgorgement, most producers will add what is known as liqueur d'expedition. It is a sugar that will determine how sweet or dry our champagne will be. The classical brut allows up to 12 grams of sugar per liter, but most of the wines will vary around 7 to 9 grams. Now, our bottle of champagne is sealed with the classical natural cork we all know and love. And the best producers will allow their wines a few months in the cellars to calm down from that crazy journey before they are packed and shipped to us, the champagne lovers. So here you go, this is just a simple, fast walkthrough of the champagne winemaking. I want to know that it can vary amongst the producers. If you have watched this video till the end, it means that you love champagne. So here is another video on champagne, which I filmed while I was visiting the region.